Hi everyone, and thank you very much for subscribing to this fourth session on data science illustrated with Excel stats. Today we'll be talking about statistical modeling. So my name is Jean-Paul Maillouf. I work as a data science consultant at the Adinsoft company, which develops the Excel stats software. I will be using Excel stat to run demonstrations around statistical modeling today. So statistical modeling is a very broad world of statistical tools. So we won't be able to cover all of it today in just one single hour, but I will just give you a bit of sense of what are uh, statistical models useful for, useful to, and uh, how to implement them in Excel stat, at least basic models. If you want to implement your own models, please consider maybe doing some more research about statistical modeling or requesting some specific trainings from Excel stat. So those of you who don't know Excel stat, this will be a good opportunity for you to discover the product. Otherwise, please know that there will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So don't hesitate to submit your questions in the chatting window. I will try to answer as many questions as I can at the end. Unfortunately, I won't be able to answer all of them. I already apologize about this. And there will be a recording of this webinar available. You will get a link probably next week to this uh, recording so you can share it with colleagues or people who can be interested. There are handouts that you can download and data in Excel that you can also download using the appropriate button on the webinar platform. So let's get started. Here's a small outline. First, I will start with a few words about Excel stat. Then I will be talking about my specific way of dividing statistical methods into four families of tools. Then I will uh, do a small reminder on statistical testing, which was the topic of the last webinar we had, that was on Tuesday, because it's very important to understand how to interpret the output of a statistical test to be able to to interpret some aspects of the statistical modeling. Then I will start with an intuitive introduction to statistical modeling. I will illustrate this introduction with a simple linear regression. Then we'll be talking about assumptions about residuals. So residuals are a typical element that we find in statistical modeling. We'll see what residu residuals correspond to and the assumptions about them that make your model reliable or not. Then I will end the webinar on multiple linear regression. What is ExcelStat and who are we? ExcelStat is a statistical software that works as an add-on to Excel on PC and on Mac. It's also available for Excel 365 and Google Sheets. You can also use it on the cloud. So one of the main strengths of ExcelStat is that it's totally integrated inside Excel, so you really don't need to leave your Excel file where your data is stored to run your analysis. So from capturing your data to customizing your results in Excel, everything happens within the user-friendly interface of Excel. ExcelStat has more than 220 statistical features. It has more than 150K users worldwide. 25 employees, more than 25 employees, 300K monthly visits on the website. The software is available in seven different languages, and we have offices in three different time zones across the globe, so America, Europe, and Japan. The software is downloaded 10K times every month. So the software is developed by the Adinsoft company, which is established inside the Data Factory, which is a private lab in Bordeaux, France totally dedicated to data science. There are five expert companies established in the data factory, including Adinsoft. And it's very active in terms of data science as it organizes more than 25 workshops, events, and trainings every year. ExcelStat has eight specific solutions to meet your needs. So there are three generalist solutions and five solutions which are more field-oriented. 
Among the generalist solutions, we have BASIC, BASIC Plus, and Premium. BASIC has 100 statistical features which are essential to explore, visualize, and model your data in one interface. It also includes statistical testing tools. BASIC Plus has everything included in BASIC, plus essential machine learning tools. Then Premium has the complete 220 Excel stat features. And between Basic Plus and Premium, you will find a solution which is tailored for sensometricians, so which has a preference mapping, panel analysis, penalty analysis, or Keta data analysis. Life Sciences is dedicated to biostatisticians and epidemiologists for the analysis of medical and biological data. So you will find features for survival analysis, such as Kaplan-Meier. You will find also features for omics data analysis or for dose response. In marketing, you will find specific tools to uh, tailor very powerful uh, surveys, which we call conjoint analysis surveys. In forecasting, you'll be able to analyze time series and risk. Quality is dedicated to quality control, SPC and design of experiments. You have more than 200 tutorials associated to downloadable data sets online. So each and every Exerstat feature has a dedicated tutorial on the Exerstat website, which guides you through the implementation of the method and the interpretation of the results using a real world data set. XRStat develops the Stat Cafe channel that presents several statistical features in a short format with implementations on XRStat. So here are the four families of tools I told you about. First of all, in the first webinar, we talked about descriptive statistics, which allow describing single variables or the link between two variables. We talked about the mean, the standard deviation, the histogram, the box plot. We also talked about scatter plots. We're going to see once again today. Then we generalized our reasoning from descriptive statistics in the framework of exploratory statistics. So we used tools such as PCA, your principal component analysis, to summarize the information from a big multivariate data set in a few charts. And we also used tools such as AHC to cluster our data into groups of similar observations. Then the day before yesterday, we talked about statistical testing, which helped accepting or rejecting a very precise hypothesis, assuming error risks. Statistical testing helped answering questions whose answer is yes or no. So we talked about t-test, which we used to compare two averages or two means. We also talked about ANOVA, but we didn't implement it in Excel stat yet. We used chi-square to study the link between two qualitative variables. Remember the Titanic example. We used correlation test to examine or to test the link between two quantitative variables. We used Pearson's correlation test. And at last, statistical modeling, which we will be talking about today, helps understanding how a specific variable behaves according to a set of other variable and optionally statistical modeling helps making predictions so there are two purposes explanation and prediction among the statistical modeling tools we will find the very famous regression you will find ANCOVA and ANOVA today we will be talking about generalities around statistical modeling as well as regression. Next week, there will be a full webinar dedicated to ANOVA. So the difference between regression and ANOVA is that regression implies explaining one quantitative variables by a set of quantitative variables, and ANOVA implies modeling one quantitative variable by a set of qualitative variables. So you will see a guide later on in the webinar that disentangles a little bit uh, the differences between common modeling approaches. Here you will find recordings of the previous webinars 
on these links you can click on in your PDF. I think this recording has not been uploaded yet, so it will probably be online maximum next early next week. Okay, I promise. Otherwise, if you'd like to subscribe to the ANOVA webinar, which takes place next week, please don't hesitate to click on this link here. So ANOVA is widely used in uh, sensometrics and biostatistics. And there's a surprise I prepared for you today. Check this out. We've added one new webinar to the series, which is called Supervised Machine Learning and Prediction. And we programmed it on the 5th of May. You can subscribe to it here by clicking here. So supervised machine learning allow optimizing an algorithm in terms of predictive quality. We will see how the supervised machine learning process works. So this will be an introduction, of course, because we only have one hour to talk about this. We'll see what cross-validation is, and we'll investigate a few typical machine learning algorithms, such as trees and random forests. So if your goal is to optimize an algorithm in terms of predictive quality, this webinar is a good introduction for it. Here's a small reminder on statistical testing. Now, do you remember statistical tests imply questions whose answer is yes or no? I'm taking an, an example which is very basic. Is mean A significantly different from mean B or average A significantly different from average B? I remind you that statistical tests involve two hypotheses, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. According to the null hypothesis, we generally have an idea of equality. So mean A equals mean B. Null hypothesis also can be written in this way, so H0. The null hypothesis is opposed or challenges the alternative hypothesis, which generally implies an idea of a difference. So HA mean A is different from mean B. Of course, there are other ways of writing alternative hypothesis, but this is the most common one. And how to interpret the output of a statistical test? One of the most important outputs that we get is this number, which we call a p-value. So the p-value is a probability value. It's, it's bounded between 0 and 1. The p-value will be the risk that you take of being wrong while rejecting the null hypothesis and accepting the alternative hypothesis. Please note that this is not the very precise statistical definition of the p-value, but it gives you some sense of how to interpret it. You should be really careful of around the interpretation of p-value. There has been many misinterpretations in the literature. So usually you compare your p-value to a risk threshold that you, you specify, which is the risk threshold alpha. You can set it to 0 0.05, for instance. And the lower this risk, the more conservative you would be in your decision. If the p-value is lower than alpha, you reject H0 and accept HA, assuming a risk proportional to p-value of being wrong. So if p-value is lower than alpha, you say that your effect is significant. In this case, you could say that mean A is significantly different from mean B if the p-value provided by the test is lower than your risk threshold. So very soon you will get a recording of the webinar on statistical testing by clicking on this link. And of course, I recommended you in the statistical testing procedure to visualize your data. This is a very important step to identify maybe weird patterns that make your data not really reliable to run this or that test. So it's very important to describe and visualize your data prior to any test. Here's an intuitive introduction to statistical modeling. A statistical model is a simplified representation of reality using numbers. So it allows to better understand this reality and, if you want, to make predictions. Statistical modeling allows to understand or to explain and to predict. So this webinar will be more focused on this objective of or this goal of statistical modeling and not on this one. So this one will focus more on it in the machine learning webinar. I will start with a very simple 
example, toy example. Somebody asks you, what is the height of French people? There are many ways to answer this question. So imagine you have access to this table, which includes the height information in centimeters of a representative sample of 200 French people. So the first way of answering this question would be recite the whole table row after row, which doesn't really make sense because uh, the person who's asking you the, the question will only have a fuzzy representation of the height of French people. They won't be able to grasp the height information of each of them and every person. Instead, if you compute the standard deviation and the mean of the series of numbers and just provide these two numbers, then the, the person who's asking the question will have a global idea, although not very precise, of the height of French people. So you are simplifying, you are summarizing reality in a few numbers. This is what we call statistical modeling. Representing French people height by a mean and a standard deviation is already a way to model this height. We are simplifying reality using numbers. So from now on, we'll be considering maybe models which are a bit more complicated than this, but this is one first step. How does a model work? A model allows to explain one or several dependent variables using one or several independent variables which we call also explanatory, through mathematical equations involving parameters. So here's an example of an equation we can have in statistical modeling. We have a variable we want to explain. This could be the French people height. On the other side, you have the explanatory variable with a square and a plain explanatory variable. And the explanatory variable is linked to the dependent variable in an equation involving coefficients or parameters, A, B, and C. So this is a polynomial model. And once the equation is set, once you estimate A, B, and C, or the software estimates A, B, and C for you, you can use the equation to predict the dependent variable using new values of the explanatory variable. So the mean and the standard deviation model we've just seen does not imply independent variables. So it was very simple. Here are a few common modeling methods according to the dependent variable type and the explanatory variables type. So for instance, if you want to model a quantitative variable according to qualitative variables, you can use ANOVA. So ANOVA are a set of modeling methods which imply comparison of several means. So you can use ANOVA, for instance, to uh, model a quantitative variable such as invoice amount according to origin. You want to see if there's one origin that pays a little bit more on your website than other origins. Or in agronomy, you can uh, compare several fertilizer treatments in terms of yield, in uh, sensometrics, you can also compare the satisfaction or the liking of several products, mean liking of several products. So this will be the topic of next week's webinar. Otherwise, you can use linear regression to model quantitative variables according to quantitative variables. For instance, very typically in marketing, we use multiple regression to model drivers of satisfaction. We try to see which items mostly drive satisfaction or consideration. Linear regression is pretty much used in this context. Then if you want to model qualitative variables, for instance, binary variables such as in epidemiology, for instance, the occurrence of a disease or the non-occurrence of the disease. So this is a binary variable, zero and one. If you want to model this according to a set of parameters, you can use logistic regression. Of course, this is a very small table of all the possibilities. There are many, many more possibilities, and among them, you can find a few of them on this guide. 
which is presented the same way as the guide I showed you on your PowerPoint. So according to the type of dependent variable and the type of explanatory variables, you have different parametric models that are available. Of course, there are more. And the conditions of validity of these models, you will see that there are conditions of validity. Otherwise, I have included also other solutions that you can use in each context. So let me start now with simple linear regression. And of course, I will take an example, which is based on this data set that many of you already know. This is data from the clients from an online shoe selling platform. So the CRM sheet in your Excel workbook. So we have different clients and rows of an online shoe selling platform. These clients are characterized by variables and columns. Some of these variables are quantitative. They are expressed in terms of numbers, such as height, shoe size, weight, time spent on site, and invoice amount. And some of them are qualitative. So they are expressed in terms of categories, such as origin, gender, or preferred brand. Now, the question I ask is, how does invoice amount, which is here, vary according to time spent on site? Now, based on this question, I can already identify which variable would be the dependent variable and which one would be the independent. In this case, if I say, how does invoice amount vary according to time spent on site? I am trying to explain invoice amount according to time spent on site. Do you agree on that? So invoice amount will be the dependent variable and time spent on site will be the independent variable. First thing one could do and which I strongly recommend would be to visualize or to describe the link between these two variables using, for instance, a scatter plot. So I remind you that in Excel stat you can draw a scatter plot using the scatter plot uh, feature, which is located here. I can show you once again, if you like. So visualizing data, scatter plots. I will include in the dialog box time spent on site on X and invoice amount on Y. And I obtain my report in a new Excel spreadsheet. There we go. So what you can see already is that there globally is a decrease of invoice amount according to time spent on site. And this decrease can be expressed in different shapes. We can express this decrease in the form of a line, a straight line, or maybe something which is more curved. There is no magical model which fits each and every data set. Now I will just illustrate one specific model, which is very common and which we call simple linear regression, but it's really not mandatory to every time choose one specific model for one task or one, um, or one question. So here is how a simple linear regression looks like. It's a straight line. Regression of invoice amount by times time spent on site. Mathematically, here's how we write down the simple linear regression, y equals a plus b x. So a will be the first parameter or coefficient. This will be the y coordinate of the intersection between the line and the y axis. Otherwise, b will represent the slope of the line. So if b is negative, the slope is negative. So there's a decrease of invoice amount when time spent on site increases. If B is positive, then the slope is positive and there would be a positive relationship between two, the, the two variables. Now, if B is equal zero or approaches zero, the line would be flat. Now, let me translate this in terms of the names of the variables. Here's how we can rewrite the equation. Usually we place the dependent variable on the y-axis and replace the independent variable on the x-axis. And a and b are the parameters or the coefficients. Otherwise, there are parts of reality the model wasn't able to capture. So 
as you can see, the line doesn't really pass through each and every point. There's a part of the reality we weren't able to capture, and this part of reality, we can represent it using these arrows. So all the differences between the points, all the points and the line are called the errors or the residuals. So this is what we were unable to capture using our model. So we chose linear modeling, but this was not mandatory. The question allows us to choose a model which is less linear if the data and the interpretation product provide enough justification for this. So you are really not obliged every time to use simple linear regression if you want to model one quantitative variable according to another one. So how are the parameters estimated? The best parameter values are those that minimize these arrows. Okay. The best straight line would be the one that minimizes the residuals or the errors. So that would be written in this shape. The best values of A and B are the ones that minimize the sum of the arrows, which is expressed here. So Y corresponds to the observed data, observed points. And A plus BX correspond to what's predicted by the model. And of course, we used the square for mathematical convenience. But this calculation, the software does it for you, so you don't really have to worry about this. So in simple models, the software used this procedure, which, which we call least square estimation. And in other models, which are more complex, the software uses maybe other ways to compute the values of A and B. So how to run a simple linear regression in Excel stats? I will use this modeling data menu, which includes linear regression. So here's the linear regression dialog box, which is quite complex. There are many interesting things inside. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to run through it. So most of the modeling data tools in Exercet are organized this way. You can fill out data in, in uh, the dependent variables field and in the explanatory variables field. So here, if I take this field, I should be filling out the dependent variable. So this is invoice amount. Otherwise, here I can capture time spent on site, which is my quantitative explanatory variable. So I click OK. And I get the results. So among the most important or interesting results in regression is this table here, okay, which is the model parameters. So each row here corresponds to one specific coefficient or parameter in the model. Here we go. If we took a, uh, y equals a plus bx, this is A and this is B. A is the intercept, so it's the Y coordinate of the intersection between the line and the Y axis. And time spent on site will be the slope, so B. First of all, we get the parameter estimation. The intercept estimation is estimate is 244, and the slope is minus 2.4. 35. So that was expected as the slope was negative or the slope yeah, was not flat and was going down. Second thing that could be interested, interesting to notice in this table is the p-values associated to the parameters. So these are p-values. These p-values are associated to the null hypothesis stating that the parameter equals zero and the alternative by hypothesis that says the parameter is different from zero. So how to interpret these p-values? For instance, take the slope. The slope is negative and the associated p-value is very low, which means that we can reject the null hypothesis that says that the parameter is equal zero and accept the alternative hypothesis that the parameter is different from zero. This means that this number here, this value is significantly different from zero and the slope is significantly not flat. 
And of course, these are estimations, so they are bounded in confidence intervals, which measure how confident you are in the estimation of these numbers. So you have a link to the simple linear regression tutorial here. Otherwise, look here, you have the equation. So y equals a plus bx, in which b and a were replaced by the values which were estimated here. And this equation can be used to predict invoice amount according to new values of time spent on site. So here's a little bit more about the interpretation. We said that invoice amount significantly decreases with time spent on site, and the associated coefficient is negative and significantly different from zero. How to interpret this number, this specific number here? This means that when time spent on site will increase by one unit, the invoice amount will decrease by 2.35. Then the intercept is positive and significantly different from zero. This value corresponds, as I told you, to the y-coordinate of the intersection between regression line and the y-axis. It is the value of invoice amount when time spent on site equals zero. So it doesn't really make sense in the study. It makes sometimes more sense in uh, biochemistry, for instance, or, uh, or in agronomical studies on biostatistics. Sometimes the intercept can be interesting. At the bottom of the Excel stat report, you get this chart, which is a scatter plot on which your model or the line is drawn. So this straight line in the middle corresponds to your regression model. So there's something else I need to show you also on this chart, it's these two envelopes. So you have one thin envelope around the model here, which is represented with dashed lines, and you have a thicker one, which is represented with full lines, okay? So each envelope corresponds to one specific confidence interval. The thin one is the confidence interval of the model, so linked to parameter estimation. So it shows you how confident you are in the estimation of this line here. Otherwise, the thick one is the confidence interval for predictions. So this means when you will run predictions from this uh, line here, this will represent the confidence you have in, uh, in your predictions. So this is very thick in our case, so our model wouldn't be a very good predictive model, probably. And as you can see, you have one new quantity here, which was uh, computed. This is the R squared. R squared reflects the goodness of fit of the model to the data, and it's bounded between zero and one. So the higher the R squared, the more concentrated the points are around the line. And we will see more general interpretation elements in multiple linear regression. So let us answer the question now. Invoice amount significantly decreases and in a linear way with time spent on site. Of course, there are other models we could have tested, but we don't have enough time to do it. We still need to check a couple of things to make sure the model is reliable we'll have to talk about assumptions about residuals. There are some hypotheses around residuals we should check in order to make sure our model is reliable. So first of all, of course, you need to check the linearity of the relationship between Y and X, or to, to say that you can model this in terms of a linear model or a straight line. Otherwise, there are more assumptions you should verify linked to it residuals, so your residuals should be independent. You need to have one measurement per individual. Your residuals should be should follow a normal distribution or a bell-shaped distribution. Shouldn't have many outliers. And this is one of the most complicated words in statistics. You need to have homoscedasticity in your residuals. So they should have a homogeneous variance. Now, I will show you one general diagnosis chart which allows you to uh, validate more or less your model. And this is the standardized residuals versus predictions, which is provided automatically in the 
regression report in XRStat. So check this chart. If the dots are homogeneously spread around this line, the horizontal line, with more concentration of points around the line and points more spread at the extremes of the chart, then the model is valid. You shouldn't be seeing any specific clean pattern here inside this chart. Otherwise, your model wouldn't be valid. In our case, look, there may be two dots here that are too far away at the top. So th these could be outliers in the data. And if you look very closely, you will see that there is some kind of curve occurring here. So our model is not that reliable. Do you remember there was some kind of a curved shape in the scatter plot? Here we see it in a more precise way. So maybe a linear regression wouldn't have been the right model to use in this case. Otherwise, you should know that for each of these assumptions, there are specific diagnosis charts or specific tests you can run to verify them. So for instance, I will show you how to run a normality test to see whether your residuals follow a normal distribution or don't differ significantly from a normal distribution. I will click on the replay button here to obtain my linear regression dialog box once again. And in the outputs of the linear regression dialog box, there are several sub-tabs. I will go to the test assumptions and make sure the normality test option is activated. So I click OK. I obtain my result once again with the model parameters. And at the bottom, here is the diagnosis chart I told you about. At the bottom, you get the normality test for the residuals. So you get a p-value, a null hypothesis, and an alternative hypothesis. The p-value is very high, so you cannot reject the null hypothesis that says that the residuals follow a normal distribution. So the residuals do not significantly differ from a normal distribution. Now, be very careful about these normality tests. They are not very reliable if you have a low number of data points. So please don't use this test, for instance, if you only have 10 data points. It wouldn't be reliable. It wouldn't be, have enough power. Now let me show you a couple of uh, typical cases of violation of the hypothesis uh, assumptions about residuals. You can have this pattern of violation. If you look closer at this, chart, you see that there are many ups and downs, like periodic ups and downs. Can you see them? So here you are violating the independence assumption. You have a periodic pattern. This means that the residuals are autocorrelated. And this is typically found in time series implying periodicity. So here you have uh, like measurements of, for instance, say uh, some meteorological parameter at temperature every month and on several years. So every 12 points, you have the pattern repeating itself. In this case, if you run a regression on this data, it wouldn't be much reliable. Otherwise, this is a violation of the homoscedasticity assumption. So as you can see, the residuals variance change according to some specific explanatory variables, such as age, for instance. So this frequently appears when variance is a function of the mean. You will see these patterns in the diagnosis chart that I showed you. And in this case, you can say that your model is not reliable. Now, here are a few solutions when the assumptions are violated. If you have outliers, for instance, you need to think about them. Did you make a mistake while, while capturing your data, for instance? Or I don't know, are the data points corresponding to outliers really representative of your population, the population you're studying. Well, in some cases, you can correct them if you find out where the, the mistake is. Otherwise, if you have a very good reason to remove them from the analysis, you may remove them from the analysis. 
Then one common thing that you can do is transforming the Y data or even the X data and relaunch the analysis. And among the common transformations, you will find the log or the square root or the box cost transformation, which is included in Excel stat. If the relationship is nonlinear, for instance, if you're running, I don't know, in biochemistry, if you're running um, Michael Ismanton model for uh, enzymatic activity, you can use a very specific nonlinear model, and you have a tutorial here to see how to implement this kind of models in Excel stat. Now, if the dependent variable is binary, you can lose, use a logistic regression, as I showed you on the guide earlier. And in cases of periodic autocorrelation, time series, for instance, you can run ARIMA model using XRSAT forecasting solution. So here's a link once again to the modeling method guides. And at last, the last part of this webinar will be talking about multiple linear regression. Here are the principles of multiple linear regression. This tool helps investigating the linear influence of several explanatory or independent variables on the dependent variable. So instead, in, instead of having y equals a plus bx, we'll have one coefficient associated to each of the independent variables, we'll have many. So this allows to take into account the multivariate aspect of the world, which is closer to reality. So the number of parameters equals the number of explanatory variables plus one. So you have three explanatory variables here. Number of parameters equals one, two, and three coefficient linked to the variables plus one intercept. A few warnings. In addition to the assumptions about residuals, which are still important in this case, beware of two things, overfitting and multicollinearity. So these two aspects, I'll be developing them in the upcoming slides. And here's an additional constraint. The number of explanatory variables cannot be higher than the number of observations. So you cannot have more columns than rows if your variables are stored in columns and observations in rows. Otherwise, there are solutions for specific data sets where you have more variables than observation. Typically in uh, chemometrics, you can have like hundreds of variables and just a few observations, you have specific solutions for this kind of analysis, such as the PLS regression or the Ridge or Lasso regression. Let me develop this overfitting constraint we have in multiple linear regression. When you increase the number of explanatory variable, you will increase automatically the R square or the goodness of fit. The more you include variables, the more the model will fit the data. Do not add too many of them, otherwise you will obtain a model that is too fitted to your particular data and that will subsequently be less generalizable to new data. So it will be too fitted to your specific data. Look at this model, which implies a very high number of variables. Okay. It's too much fitted to the data points. Now, how to evaluate this problem? You can use an index or a statistical index, which is called the AIC. The AIC is a compromise between a good fitting of the model to the data without using a very high number of variables or parameters. Okay. So AIC is a quality index linked to the models. But be very careful. AIC is a relative quality index that should only be used to compare models with each other. And the model with the lowest AIC is the best model in the model set. When you will compute one model specifically, of course, you will have an AIC value, but you cannot really interpret this AIC on its own. You need to compare the AIC of this model to AICs of other models built on the same set of y values or of dependent variables value. I will take these three models, which are built on the same y values series. Here we have a model with only two parameters, so linear regression. Here we have a model with three parameters. This is a polynomial quadratic model. 
and here we have one with five parameters. And each time I have computed the AIC, and as you can see, the winning mother or the best mother, the one with the lowest AIC is this one, because it fits fairly the data without being overfitting. And on the other hand, it's not poor as poor as this model here, which really does not fit the data quite well. So we fairly fit the data using three parameters. And according to the AIC index, this will be the best model among the set. Second thing we should be aware of in multivariate modeling or multiple linear regression, or when you include many variables which are explanatory, the curse of multicollinearity. Beware of redundant explanatory variables or variables which measure more or less the same thing. For instance, if you measure the effects of day temperature and night temperature on the production of a crop, you are more or less measuring the same thing because these two variables are very correlated usually. So it doesn't really make sense to include both of them in the model. If you measure the effects of size and weight of cows on milk production, you are also more or less testing or um, evaluating the effect of the same thing. So this is what we call multicollinearity. When you include many variables that represent the same thing that are redundant, there are, that are correlated. The danger about multicollinearity is that first of all, the evaluation or the estimation of the coefficients could be misleading, could be wrong. And on the other hand, in extreme cases, sometimes the computations can be blocked by strong multicollinearities in your data. The way of measuring multicollinearity is, among others, measuring the variance inflation factor, or VIF, measures the degree of redundancy of an explanatory variable with the other variables in the set. But usually, if the VIF is higher than a certain threshold, some people or some authors set the threshold at 1, others at 3, others at 10. If VIF is higher than the threshold, the variable is redundant. So it's an arbitrary threshold and it should be tuned according to the degree of severity you want to have. So if you find out that a variable is too multicollinear or redundant with the others based on the IF, you can think why and maybe eliminate it and relaunch the model. I will launch a multiple regression based on this question. So which variables among these have the strongest linear influence on invoice amounts. So I will get back to, first of all, my data set. One first thing we can do is maybe visualize the relationships between these variables. So I will go to test the hypothesis and correlation and association tests, then correlation tests to obtain uh, scatter plot matrix. I want to use another way of selecting data in Excel stat. I use this way here. I want to select data using variables to show you that there are many ways of doing so. I will take invoice amount, for instance, height, shoe size, weight, and time spent on site. In the charts tab, I ask for scatter, scatter plots in the matrix of plots. So we've seen this in the last webinar. Here's what we obtained. Here we have all our variables in Y and all our variables stored also in X. So each scatter plot here corresponds to a scatter plot between the two corresponding variables. Here we have a scatter plot between shoe size and height, between weight and height. Check, check this out. We see that weight and height are highly correlated. So maybe they are too multicollinear and doesn't really make sense to include both of them in the model. So it's always very interesting to check the data. Even I really strongly suggest checking the, or visualizing the data prior to any modeling approach. For instance, here we see that we, we have two separated groups, which could be very interesting to take into consideration in our modeling approach. So for now, I'll just stick to multiple linear regression and I will get back to this 
and select invoice amount according to time spent on site weight, shoe size, and height. In the outputs, I recommend activating multicollinearity statistics. So I'm clicking OK. And there we go. Here are our VIFs. As we expected, height and weight are linked to very high VIFs. This means that they are redundant in the set of variables. We should be running the model again while excluding height or weight. So this is what we'll do. So here I take invoice amount once again as a dependent variable, and I will select only shoe size, weight, and time spent on site and see what happens with VIFs. So the VIFs are much better now. Then among the outputs, we get this small uh, table, which represents goodness of fit statistics. For instance, we have the we get the standard R square that is much higher than the one we got earlier. As I told you, when you increase the number of explanatory variables, you increase the R square. The adjusted R square is a less optimistic equivalent of R square, and it takes into account the number of variables, which are explanatory, and allows you, as such, to compare the models with the same dependent variable data. So it has maybe more or less the same role, it plays the same role as AIC. AIC only makes sense when it's compared to AICs of other models, I remind you. And SBC can be interpreted just like AIC, and it's also called BIC in some references. Otherwise, you also get a model parameters table with one row per coefficient or parameter. Here we can see that the coefficient linked to weight is the only one among the explanatory variables which is significant, as you can see, which is linked to a very low p-value. So how to interpret this number here? If all the other variables were maintained constant, an increase of weight by one unit results in an increase of invoice amount by 0 0.293. Of course, you can check the assumptions about residuals using this chart I told you about. Here we see that there are two bubbles which are constituted. This could be the consequence of a two-category qualitative variable which splits the data into two groups. It could be interesting to check this out using an ANCOVA model. Also know that in the options of um, the linear regression in Excel stats, you can ask the software to proceed with a model selection so in this case, you can ask the software to try all the combinations of variables and run a multiple lin linear regression out of these combinations and every time compute a quality index such as AIC and at the end, just conserve the model with the lowest AIC. So this allows you to locate the most influent independent variables on the dependent variables. So to sum up, Statistical modeling allows to investigate how dependent variables evolve according to explanatory variables. And they also allow to predict using so the equation which we produce. And prediction will be the topic of the webinar on machine learning in two weeks. Linear models are reliable, reliable only under certain assumptions related to residuals. And beware of overfitting and multicollinearity if you include many explanatory variables. And according to variable types, different models are available. You have a small guide with common modeling tools. Otherwise, you have a much wider guide here. And as I remind you, the modeling, statistical modeling is a very broad word, which is quite complex. I just gave you a sense of how it works and what are its purposes. Be very careful in the interpretation. And uh, please do, I really advise you to do some research before running statistical modeling or request specific trainings to Excel stat if you want to go further in modeling your own data. I propose to take a couple of questions before saying goodbye. How to calculate the AIC? So the AIC I showed you is provided by Excel stat in the outputs. There you go, of a regression. Is there any standard to say that the VIF is too high? 
<clears throat> while there are different thresholds that are proposed by different authors, I would advise you to see what's recommended in your specific field of expertise. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. I hope I'll be able to talk to you once again next week. Have a very good day.